Welcome to the ORS virtual scientific session, The Future of Meniscal Repair, Clinical, Biologic, and Material Considerations, organized by the ORS Meniscus Section. I am pleased to introduce today's moderators, Jay Patel, Jennifer Poetzer, and Chat Jayasuriya. Dr. Patel is an assistant professor at Emory University. Dr. Poetzer is an assistant professor at VCU. And Dr. Jayasuriya is an assistant professor at Brown University and Rhode Island Hospital. All three are members of the ORS and serve as officers of the meniscus section. I am happy to present Dr. Jay Patel. Thank you, Shree, uh, for that introduction. Before we get started, we'd like to just thank everyone that attended the meniscus section social hour this past Tuesday. Um, we've been really excited by this week of the meniscus. It's been really successful. All right. Um, today's session is meant to review the clinical management of meniscus tears to identify the specific needs for augmented repair and to cover biologic and material-based advances in the field uh, that are being developed to address this gap. So um, I'd like to thank you all also for joining us today. We have three wonderful speakers lined up. Um, we have Drs. Uh, Robert LaParade, Chang Lee, and Jennifer Robinson. Our first speaker is Dr. Robert LaParade, an orthopedic surgeon at Twin Cities Orthopedics. Over his career, he has published over 500 peer-reviewed manuscripts and has won numerous awards, including the OREF Clinical Research Award, considered the Nobel Award of Orthopedics, um, and the AOSSM Excellence in Research Award. Dr. LaParade is an expert in the field and considered one of the top knee surgeons in the world. So thank you for joining us, uh, Rob, and I'll leave it to you. So what I'll try to do is go through more of the carpentry work and then the brainy people after, the, after me will speak more about what we need to do to improve things going into the future. So these are my disclosures. Some of them are relevant to this topic because I, I work with a lot of companies to try to improve technology for meniscus repairs. So I, I think it's all well known that the menisci are essential for joint health. They're commonly torn and the problem is they're relatively avascular. The issues are is that only a third of repairable tears are repaired and that's something that has to be improved in the, in the future. And the full disclosure of my talk is that this is a simple surgery talk. I'm not really going into the biologics and other technical issues involved here. So the issues that we have to consider as surgeons is that we want to increase healing of these relatively avascular areas. And I think it's important to recognize that they're relatively avascular because a lot of them heal when we stabilize them. We have to look at where can we expand repairs. And we have to try to encourage surgeons to repair more with education, improving technology, uh, better use of biologics, and also the equipment that we're using. So the types of tears that we're looking at that are potentially fixable are the repairable peripheral and ramp tears, radial tears and root tears, and there's many others, the white white zone, double buckets and horizontals that I really won't go into today because of time limits. But here's what the natural history is of a post-menisectomy knee. For a partial medial menisectomy, there's a high risk, and the lateral meniscus has a very high risk. So this is a 33-year-old male, and you can see when he's standing up in the upper picture that the x-ray shows there's a joint space, and then we get the flex knee Rosenberg view, and there's no joint space. So that's a disaster for this patient because we can't do a lot for him. And you can see on this MRI here, the articular cartilage is still intact in the front because the meniscus was taken out in the back. And that's why these standing Rosenberg views are so important. And the regular standing view doesn't really show the extent of the, of the problem that he has. So when we're looking at these peripheral meniscus tears, they have a better blood supply. Uh, we can look at doing inside out, which is a gold standard, uh, all inside devices, which is about 90% of meniscus repairs, and then outside in, which is a lot of, of countries outside the US because of cost that they can do some outside in relatively inexpensive, even though it's a, a technical challenge. The inside out repairs that we're looking at are important because we can space the sutures about three millimeters apart. And there's really small puncture holes here. So they don't make a big hole in the meniscus like the all inside devices do. And a lot of the all inside devices propagate the tears more. 
And then we can have multiple different configurations that we can look at. We can look at vertical mattress, we can look at horizontal, we can look at oblique. The problem is, is when you're looking at inside out repairs, you have to have a skilled assistant to catch the needles and make sure you're not going to damage any of the neurovascular structures. So those are the limitations is that a lot of people don't have access to a skilled assistant. So you have to rely on your surgical, surgical scrub nurse. And in those cases, they use the all inside devices, which work pretty well, but they do have a bigger risk of having tear propagation when they are used. And what about a ramp tear? So this is a new term that's really caught on. It's a, a capsular uh, detachment of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and is commonly associated with an ACL tear. And we're starting to find out biomechanically that if you don't repair a ramp tear, there's a high risk of having the ACL graft fail. And the reason it's called a ramp is because normally the meniscus would attach on the lateral side to the top of the meniscus. And on the medial side, it attaches two thirds of the way down. So it's been called a ramp before it gets down there and it forms a ramp shape. And that's, that's what's involved with these medial meniscal tears. Now we know with peripheral tears, the biology is pretty good. We've got this classic picture from Steve Arnosky in 1982. And we also know that for years that when we did meniscus repairs with ACL reconstructions, the success rate was great. But with isolated repairs, it was anywhere from 50 to 70% success rate. And what we're figuring out is, especially with some of our Italian colleagues, is that there's some intrinsic growth factors in the marrow that has an anabolic effect on healing that helps these to, to propagate better. And, and we validated that when we went and did some marrow venting procedures with isolated repairs. And we found out that adding these results in a significant difference in the repair rate. So we were able to improve the success rate to 88% with the marrow venting compared to the historical numbers. And when we looked at the same numbers with ACL with medial meniscal repairs, it was 92%. So there really wasn't any significant difference between those. What about radial tears? These have classically been considered a disaster tear. It's when we have a, a tear that's oriented perpendicular to the main peripheral hoop fibers and it disrupts the meniscus, especially when it spreads apart like this, so you can see in this slide, and it impairs the, the force on the joint, and it basically it creates a non-functional meniscus. And historically, the treatment was to do partial meniscectomies, and all these patients had good short-term pain relief because the mechanical irritant was gone, but it can lead to accelerated articular cartilage wear. So unfortunately, these are common in high school athletes, especially high school American football, and it was leading to the need for meniscal transplantation. And you can see this is an, an Olympic skier of mine that had a, a radial tear in the back. So the historical outcomes, they were suboptimal. It was a high reoperation rate. So we looked at better ways to, to do these repairs. And first we looked at a systematic review. And actually the systematic review showed these patients didn't do too bad. And because a lot of these were performed in the Far East, they do a lot of second look arthroscopies and found out that they were healing quite well. And then the Shino's group in Japan came up with a better way to repair these where they put some vertical mattress and use them as a, a stay to be able to put the horizontal mattress sutures around that. And they found with theirs and did second look scopes, they were finding they were healing quite well. So rather than taking them out, we're trying to look at repairs. We looked at it about the same time as Shino's group, where we looked at the fact that the current horizontal repairs weren't quite looking as well, especially when they're separated apart. So we were doing a lot of research at the time on root tears, and I wanted to treat each end of these tears uh, like a root tear. So we put sutures in them and then crisscross them and pull the sutures at the rim down tunnels, so it pulled the rim back together. And we know from other studies that the rim is the most important part. And then we do the horizontal mattress or crisscross sutures to, to augment that. So I had a patient that was an engineer that I talked about it and decided to uh, proceed with it. Here's his original picture showing the separation. And he basically could not uh, run and he was having trouble with walking, but he hadn't had any accelerated arthritis yet. I did a release of the tissues to be able to pull the edges back together and then put them, put root type repairs and crisscross them in there and then so, sewed it together. And I did PRP and, and BMAC augmentation, whether that helps or not. And this is the illustration showing what's going on. And the second look scope in him showed it had healed. 
and he's still able to run five plus years post-op. I just been in touch with him eight years post-op and he's still doing well with this. So obviously it's not gonna be perfect at this interface, but looking at better ways to be able to pull the meniscus back into apposition and have it be a relative shock absorber is important. Uh, we also looked at a, um, this two tunnel technique in, in the lab and found out that when we had these tunnels on each side of it, there was less gapping and stronger failure loads. Our outcomes in this show that they were doing quite well. The preoperative lysosomes were poor. Our post-op were almost equal to what we're seeing in ACL reconstructions. And when we looked at them comparing to our inside out vertical tear repairs, the outcomes were very similar. So it's a technique that's been pushed, especially when the, the tear is significantly far apart with better outcomes. Now root tears are something that our group has done an extensive amount of, of, of research on and surgery. And it started out in the early 2000s that I started seeing these in younger patients that were sent to me for cartilage resurfacing. And I found out they had root tears. And I was starting to think that was the, that was the issue that was going on is that the, the root tears were causing the cartilage lesions. And we know that they can lead to rapid onset arthritis. And mostly we're looking at these radial root tears where there's an, a tear that's close to the attachment site of the posterior horn of the meniscus. And in some studies, especially in Asia, they found out it's a very common source. Right. Look at, this is what they look like where it's detached from the attachment site. And why we need to fix them? Well, we know from Chris Harner's work is that when you do have this detachment, it's equivalent to a total meniscectomy when it's a root tear. And we found out when we looked at the radial root tears, when we looked at the intact situation, a three millimeter tear, six millimeter and nine millimeter, when we cut them and then we repair them down to the anatomic attachment site, it basically restores the joint contact pressures. So we know that you can do a repair up to one centimeter away from the root attachment. And you can see here also in the pressure sensors that it's basically bringing it back to normal when we're doing a repair. So it's important that we restore the joint contact forces in these root tears. Lateral meniscus root tears commonly look like this. Most of them occur with an ACL, but not all the time. And these can also be a problem because they can lead to rapid arthritis. And we can see here in the contact pressures, especially when you get up to six millimeters away, you're significantly overloading that compartment. And so we found out that in addition to causing overload of the compartment, we're also seeing problems in that the ACL graft can be overloaded and it can fail when you have a root tear. Another issue was to look at, at a repair in a non-anatomic position. And what was happening is I was starting to get referrals that had uh, outstanding repairs where they healed, but the meniscus wasn't pulled back in the joint and it was still extruded and they just weren't working. So we found out when you just tack the meniscus only five millimeters away from its attachment site. It's basically like not doing the repair. So peripheral release is important to be able to reduce the extrusion and pull the meniscus back into the joint. Here's a classification system that we devised for this. Um, basically most tears that we're talking about clinically are type two, type five of the pediatric that tear off with some bone. The technique that most people are using are the transtibial techniques. We use two tunnels. There's some other systems that use one tunnel. I think it's just a matter of getting the meniscus back to the attachment site and having a solid and secure repair. So this is what it looks like when you see them clinically. The meniscus commonly is a, a radial tear. Here I have to do a release of the meniscus because it's stuck in place. You just can't pull it back with some sutures. You have to release it to be able to pull it back in place. And then we have to decorticate the area because you know that the uh, meniscus doesn't have a great healing potential and it's not going to heal back to articular cartilage. So we have to take some of that articular cartilage down and decorticate the area. And you can see me pulling the meniscus back to that position. And then I'll drill some tunnels in. I drill two small tunnels because I want to ensure that the meniscus can be pulled down to that area that I've decorticated. One tunnel tends to make it just pooch down so I try to put the tunnels about five millimeters apart so that we can make sure that we have the best chance of having good opposition against a decorticated bone. Um, we'll place in some self-capture sutures. These are some of the advancements we've made in the last decade. In the past, we used to use rotator cuff instruments and shuttle them from the back, but now we have the ability to have self-capture sutures. 
and then we can shuttle them down those cannulas that we previously drilled. So we'll have that one in, have a second one in, and then shuttle them down the cannulas. And what'll happen is we can pull the meniscus back into a more reduced position. Fixation wise, I like to use a button. Um, you can tie them over the tibia, but we found out in the lab it tended to cut into the bone because these sutures are, are quite strong. And then here's what the final result looks like in these cases. We like to keep them non-weight bearing for six weeks. This is something we'd like to make some advancements on. But in, when they did the second look arthroscopies in Korea, they were finding out that they were tearing more often in people that were early weight bearing. So we know that there has to be some limitations on weight bearing with these. Outcomes wise, we're getting better outcomes. A lot of these patients have some arthritis underlying, so they're not being perfect. The important thing is we didn't find there was a difference in people that were less than 50 and older than 50, which was a concern early on. So overall conclusions, complex meniscus tears need to be repaired when possible and more often. The repairs work, so we need to do them. Uh, they can result in the rapid development of osteoarthritis if they're not treated. And we have to strive to have improved biologic enhancement and improved technology in the future so we can improve our ability to repair the meniscus. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, thank you for uh, sharing your clinical expertise with us today. Now that we've established the clinical management of meniscus tears, I am excited to introduce our second speaker today, uh, Dr. Chang Lee. Dr. Lee is an associate professor at Columbia University with several years of experience in research revolving around meniscus repair and regeneration. Uh, thank you for joining us, Chang. So, you know, thank you again for having me in this exciting webinar. So, you know, we just had a great talk about uh, meniscus repair from the surgeon's point of view. So I would like to cover some of the recent progress in development of biological augmentation approaches for meniscus repair. So I have no completely interest to disclose. So here's my acknowledgement of people in the lab and the funding source and the collaborators. So when we talk about the meniscus augmented repairs, it mostly target ABS joint tears, says so we are, you know, they, they are hardly repaired, they're hardly here. So, you know, I just want to show one good example here. So as you can appreciate that the suture repair the tears uh, in the ABS joint showed no sign of healing or tissue integration, even after 24 weeks in vivo. This is the dog model. So to support or facilitate the healing of such a meniscus tear, the various biological augmentation has been tested that include cytokines and growth factors and uh, enzymes such as collagenase, microRNA, and various types of cells that include primary cells such as meniscus cell, chondrocyte, and stem progenic cells include bone marrow MSC, synovium MSC, adipose derived stem cells, and cartilage progenic cells, even the blood 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 the best drive and tonsil drive MSCs have been tested for meniscus repair. So here is the list of the some growth factors and enzymes tested to improve the meniscus repair. So as I summarized here, so each growth factors have a specific roles, so either to promote the chondrogenic differentiation or angiogenesis, sometimes used to cell proliferation recruitment, matrix formation and cell recruitment or the matrix softening to promote cell migration. So these factors have one or two major functions. It showed a pretty meaningful improvement when combined together the repair model. And but however, their efficiency is highly affected by delivery mode. That means depending on the release rate or, or you know, location and dose wise, it you know affected by many different factors. So, so their outcome often end up with the suboptimal or controversials, which is likely due to because the application of a single growth factor may be too simple to address complex healing process of meniscus. And what about the cells, which may play multiple roles in, in the course of meniscus healing? So in earlier studies, cells were simply injected into the joint capture. So actually Sekia lab in the Japan had a series of publication where they injected the synovium MSC into the joint capsule so they pretty showed a pretty promising outcome in the rat, rabbit, and the pig model. Like you can see that their healing was pretty much improved when you know injected those cells after segmented defect. So another group in China also showed that injection of meniscal cells in the red joint improved the healing of those meniscus defect. So however, still question remains. So how to guide localization of injected cells? So and also it worked 
pretty well for the big chunk of tissue defect, but what about tear model? So, you know, luckily we have a Jerashir lab, so recently published papers to address those questions. So they identified the CD1.166 positive chondroprogenitor cells, the CPC, with some regenerative potential. So when they apply those cells to the SDF1 pretreated the red NHS6 plot model, so you can see the cells migrate there and the forming the tissue healing. But with CSCR for inhibition, those number of cells interrupted at the healing zone was uh, significantly reduced. So these data you know, suggest the potential strategy to promote those injected cells recruitment into the defect site using CXSR4 and the SDF1 control delivery system. So, and we can also think about in situ radiation approach rather than delivering cells. So which is uh, simply to use the body's own stem cells such as circulating stem cell or local stem progenitor cell or tissue resident cells by applying the growth factors or small molecules with or without our scaffold system. So this in situ radiation approach may have a potential to overcome current limitations associated with the acceptable cell culture and cell delivery. So what could be the good cell source for the endogenous regeneration of meniscal tear? So first candidate of course can be the meniscal cell. So in this 2017 paper from the Martin Group of the University of Iowa, showing that, that there are you know, migrating cells when meniscus have injury. So they identify these cells as regenerative potential and show the promoting, promote the cell healing. So more likely in the outer zone, not much in the inner zone. But however, if you ever work with the real meniscus tissue, you do not know how seriously dense this structure is. So one would hardly imagine how are you able to, you know, promote cell migration to this dense structure to the defect site. So to facilitate those migration of meniscal cells, so collagen has been applied for softening matrix. So actually Rob Marx, Marx group in the pen had a series of publication where they applied collagenized reaching scaffold into the meniscal defect model, both the ex vivo and in vivo, they can show the promoted the cell migration through the collagenized treatment and also better integration of the tissue healing in the ship model. So later they further, you know, modify the scaffold system to add the additional chemotectant that further improve the recruitment of the cells, you know, resulting in the cell healing as well. So more recently, the same group you know, I think a few weeks ago, they published the paper in Science Advances showing that even by softening the nucleus, they were able to improve the those cells migration. So basically they used the FDA approved the drug component called TSA that softened the, the nucleus. It, the softening use nucleus also allowed the cells more easily migrate through the chamber, including their scaffold system. And when they applied between the two pieces of the meniscus explant model, they were able to show the more cells migrate out of the tissue to promote the tissue healing. And in addition to the meniscus cells, so including our lab, other groups use the Synovian MSC as a strong candidate for endogenous healing of meniscus. So actually the number of these Synovian MSC increased a lot in the Synovian fluid when we have damage in our meniscus cartilage. So it could be the more accessible cell source so here is the approach we designed, we test a couple of times. So basically we apply the Vibolu combined with the CTGF and TGF-3 microsphere. So fast release the CTGF, recruit the Synovian MSC into defect site and form the intermediate fibrous integration and sustain with the TGF-3 later on, remodel those tissue into integrated fiber cartilage. So here's the in vivo outcome we can see. So CTGF and TGF-3 microsphere delivery allow the cell migration from synovial MSC and they undergo a differentiation into five condensate like cells and resulted in the synthesis healing of meniscus in rabbit model. So recently another group also published the data using the meniscus healing by following the synovial MSC recruitment. So in this paper they use the magnesium stitching. So actually magnesium does not promote the meniscus migration of the synovial MSC, but it allowed the synovial MSC to adhere more on that, that defect site. So as a result, they showed the improved healing of the meniscus in the rabbit tear model compared to the control group. So one may wonder then, so which one is better, meniscus cell or synovial MSC? 
So I would say both are very valid approach and very meaningful approach. But you know, luckily there's a recent study tried to answer the question. So here's the their schemic data of how they study conducted. Basically, they applied the frigid dough treatment to kill the cells in specific tissue. So they induced the apoptosis by applying the very cold temperature, so either in the meniscus or in the synovial membrane, so to see whether which cells are more responsible for the meniscus healing. So they create the big chunk of the punchy hole defect and repair with the ultra high molecular hydrogen. So here's the outcome. As you can see here, compared to the control group, untreated control group, when you damage the meniscus tissue, the healing of meniscus was not impaired at all. So pretty much a similar outcome showing that with the control group. But however, when you damage the synovial membrane, so healing was seriously damaged by the, the, the treatment of the synovial membrane. So these data suggest that synovial MSC may be you know, cell source responsible endogenous healing of meniscus. But however, this study did not incorporate any matrix the nucleus of thing that the Rob Marx group applied. So it would be very interesting if we applied those strategies together with the, you know, three-store treatment. So it would be interesting finding, you know, we can find out which there is more reliable to migrate into the defect site. So to summarize, so I believe regenerative healing of ABSQ tears is a really, really complicated, you know, process, you know, and each component, even without talking about material part, they are highly inter interconnected and in terms of the cells, matrix, inflammation, and even immune system microbiology. So they are all important. We need to consider them all together as a one unit. So you know, among these components, I would like personally highlight the one part here. So, you know, so matrix formation is not necessarily sufficient enough to lead to the guided tissue integration. So that means as we ass typically assume, sometimes assume that, so when you promote the new tissue formation, it automatically directed direct to the tissue integration, but unfortunately it does not. So we learned this lesson from long experience in the cartilage tissue engineering. So there are lots of different methods to engineer mature cartilage tissue ex vivo. But however, in vivo integration into host tissue is a separate issue. So similarly in meniscus, we need to design strategy to guide the tissue integration, not only for engineering meniscus tissue matrix. So as one of a few additional thought, so we may need to consider replacing growth factors with the small molecules. The reason is why. So I believe the growth factor typically have a higher regulatory barriers compared to the drug component with a more specific mechanism. So as an example from my lab, we recently identified a combination of small molecules they can induce the fiber chondrogenic differentiation of MSC. And another part is a joint fat pad. So somehow, so joint fat pad, you know, has been neglected in the in, in field of meniscus regeneration. So actually that fat pad, you know, provide important signal and cells in joint function and disease and the protection from the damaging. So, you know, we may have the room of the opportunity to understand the specific load of a joint fat pad. So how they regulate or involved in the process of genetic meniscus healing as well. So, and, and another another part is I wanna emphasize that. So we, so far we have tested the simple tear model. So, but it, I think it's a time to challenge a more complicated, complex tear model, including root tears with Dr. You know, with previous, previous you know, speakers emphasized. So exosome is another example of the understudied for meniscus repair. So exosome secreted from MSC actually showed the potential to promote the healing and control inflammation in bone, tendon, and many other different tissue. So we have a uh, you know opportunity to explore loads of exosome in meniscus healing as well. And and I, I, as I talked about previous slides, so this process of meniscus healing is very, very complicated. So we may need to provide a better education for the cells as well. So luckily we have emerging CRISPR technology that allow us to cut gene or even incorporate the new genes as well. So here's one example. We use the DKS9 Viper system to you know, implement the transcriptural gene network to induce the tendon regeneration. So this kind of approach can be utilized for meniscus cells to you know, promote the meniscus healing as well. So lastly, so I would like to you know, the empathize the importance of lubrication. So 
as a human patient do not visit doctors at the first day of their meniscus injury. So they typically visit doctor after three to four weeks. So while this meniscus defect was not repaired, the lubricin infiltrated into the torn surface of meniscus. So this is the example from the untreated dog meniscus. You can see lots of lubricin coated on the torn surface. But we performed a couple of studies showing that so once the lubricin coated on the surface of the meniscus, so it make it really, really hard to hear. So whenever we design the new strategy to you know, incorporate the implement the meniscus repair, we need to address the issue related to lubricin as well. So with that, so I would like to thank you all for listening and I will just you know, hand off my invisible microphone to the next speaker. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Chang, for sharing your recent advances in, uh, in biological augmentation of meniscal repair. Our third speaker today is Dr. Jennifer Robinson. Dr. Robinson is an assistant professor at the University of Kansas. Throughout her career, Jenny has developed and tested numerous material approaches for tissue repair and regeneration, and has recently received a pilot grant through the KUMC Frontiers CTSA to study meniscus progenitor cells. Uh, thank you for joining us, Jenny. Thanks, Jay, for the introduction. Sorry. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining in from whatever part of the world you are. So morning, afternoon, evening. Um, so I'm going to wrap up this session, um, which has been really exciting. And so I'm going to give um, this, the material side of the talk. And so I am Jenny Robinson. I'm an assistant professor uh, in chemical engineering at the University of Kansas. Um, and so I have no disclosures to report. And so I wanted to, I'm going to briefly, briefly touch base on a couple of points here. So as a, um, our group is a biomaterials group uh, focused on building scaffolding for, for repair, so for fiber cartilaginous tissues. And so we really think about the design criteria when we're sitting at the drawing board for what we're trying to um, build scaffolding for, for remodeling. So we're going to think about for avascular meniscal repair. And then what are the tools we have at our disposal to, design, to achieve these design criteria? So I'm going to briefly touch base on polymer chemistry and then scaffold fabrica fabrication techniques we can use. And then lastly, I'm gonna give a kind of snapshots of some work that others have done to validate these scaffolds or materials in vitro and in vivo. Uh, so I first wanna to touch base and to kind of reiterate what the previous speakers have said in that, you know, the field of meniscus repair has moved drastically in the past, uh, you know, in a short period of time. So initially the idea was like, you know, partial and full meniscectomy. Um, and so there are a couple of products on the market, at least, that can be used for full replacement, right? So there's the collagen meniscus implant that has moved around as far as titles and who sells that product. There's also a polycarbonate urethane for replacement sold um, as new surface out of active implants. And these are all focused on just giving um, kind of the goal is to restore the mechanical function, right? As Dr. LaCroix mentioned. There's a couple groups. So this is on the research side. So both from Chang and Jay, um, where they're looking at um, approaches to restore the anatomical shape and therefore the mechanical function of the full meniscus after partial full meniscectomy. And so those are what you see here using 3D printing techniques or in this example from Jay where they were looking at more patient specific design in um, recapitulating the mechanical forces and, and restoring the hoop stress in, in individual patients. And so um, this is really important, but where we want to move forward now is into how do we actually use the body's native repair capability uh, in repairing um, um, avascular meniscal tears. And so when we think about that, I'm going to take a snapshot and, and uh, inform everyone in biomaterials in two slides. Um, but so, so the field of biomaterials and tissue engineering is really, really young. And so what really has started this field was in the 1980s or so, um, physicians really didn't have materials that were FDA approved for indications that they needed. So they literally went to looking at other polymers that were used in everyday applications to say, is this something I could actually use for replacement and repair in whatever type of, of tissue I'm looking at. So for example, things like PTFE on your nonstick pans or Dacron were used for vascular grafts because they're known to resist protein adsorption. And so that's important such that you don't have occlusion of a vascular graft, right? Or things like polyurethane foams, which could be used, um, or which are in your mattresses, maybe could be used for applications such as breast implants. So this is what surgeons were thinking. Um, and so these materials were bioinert in the sense that the, really the goal here was to restore mechanical function. 
um, but not necessarily have any cell interaction, right? And so what often happens is you have a fibrous encapsulation of the material. And so excitingly, we are able to move forward from that with really resolved knowledge of cell phenotype, single cell sequencing, right? With a single cell, we know how a cell can interact with the material. And so we can design bioactive materials to directly engineer how we want cells to respond to that material for full function. And so for the avascular meniscus, as we're talking about, there's a number of things we really have to think about. Um, and whether, which one's more important or not is hard to say, right? So when we're talking about the avascular zone, I don't have to say it because everyone else has, but this is the area that's not repairing well because you don't have transport of oxygen and waste. So either we have to find ways within a material if we're using scaffolding for repair to either promote new vascularization um, or um, deliver growth factors such as Dr. Laprade was saying with VEGF um, or promote this avascular phenotype. Um, we have to think about ways to get cells into the material. Um, Chang already mentioned this a bit, but, but factors that promote cell migration and proliferation differentiation into the material. And this is a very dynamic process. It happens if we try to understand how it happened in the body, you no one can. Um, but so we have to really recapitulate that as far as dose and kinetics of what we're delivering. Um, we need to think about degradation. So obviously we don't want these materials we're gonna put in to be there forever. We really, the whole goal is to have them there with enough time for the cells to come in and make their own matrix um, and integrate with native tissue. So we have to design, there's multiple ways that a material can degrade. And so we have to design that and think about the rate and think about the environment we're going into. Um, we have to think about recapitulating the native mechanical properties. And so um, the question here is, what's the time scale? Um, and so as Dr. Laprade mentioned a little bit, um, you know, right now, waiting six weeks, but at some point, do we, do we have something that can be loaded within a couple of days or do we have, are we waiting on cells to remodel and then make, lay down their new healthy matrix? Um, we want to think about arthroscopic repair in the sense of can we inject this material that can um, essentially interact with the tissue in situ, so in an aqueous wet environment, and then remain there. And so whether this is just a glue or whether this is actually a scaffold material to promote um, cell infiltration and new differentiation and new uh, tissue. And then something that we're all kind of thinking about right now is the unique repair strategies depending on the patient. So one of the things my group looks at is what, what does the age and the sex of the patient, what, how does that play a role in regeneration and repair? Uh, and then what about the type of tissue or the type of tear, sorry, that others have already mentioned, right? So a buckled handle tear versus a radial tear are going to look very different. Um, and so uh, there's a number of ways as a biomaterial scientist that we look at how we can do achieve some of these goals. So we have two classes of polymers, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some leeway and say there's two classes of polymers that we can look at. So synthetic polymers are used very widely in biomaterials. Um, so these are uh, polyesters, um, polyglycolic acid and polycaprolactones, what you see on the screen. Those are very commonly used and they're approved in a number of indications through the FDA not for the meniscus though, but so these are polymers that can be degraded via water. So they're, so they degrade at a distinct rate. Even if you don't know anything about chemistry, you look and their structures are different. And so that dictates their function in the body. Uh, and what's really, really awesome about synthetic polymers is that we can control so much by the chemical structure that then dictates the downstream function. Um, and so this means there's less batch to batch variability and it's somewhat easier for manu manufacturing purposes. Um, the cons is that these naive polymers, without doing any functionalization on them, have no way of interacting with cells. Um, and then also the degradation products, depending on the rate that things are degraded and the size of the, the molecular weight and the size of the products that, that are achieved after degradation, may cause problems as far as clearance in the body. The other major class that I'll talk about are biopolymers. So these are polymers that are found um, mainly in humans, but sometimes in other species. And so these are things like collagen or gelatin, which is de denatured collagen, hyaluronic acid, uh, agrican, fibrin, fibronectin, agarose, alginate, et cetera. So these are all natural ECM uh, uh, proteoglycans or GAGs. Um, so they have native ways of interacting with cells. So that's what's really, really great about them. And then they can be cleaved by enzymes, right? So hyaluronidases or um, agrokinases or MMPs for collagens. So those are very much the pros of you working with these biopolymers. The cons is that it's very difficult to control their structure um, because they're very intricate um, uh, polymers, right? So it's a sequence of amino acids or a sequence of sugar uh, chains, right? So it's very hard to control their structure and then their downstream function. And then depending on how you harvest or purify and where you get your 
um, polymers, you're going to have more batch to batch variability. So those are just some of the things to think that we think about when we're designing material uh, stru uh, structures. Another thing is to think about how are we going to take this polymer and make it into a 3D porous scaffold. So I'm not going to go into all of this, but there's a number of ways that people that are working in biomaterials use to generate porous scaffolds. And we need this porosity, much like your tissue in your body, because cells need to be able to migrate through it and, and remain viable via oxygen and weight and CO2 transport and other metabolites. So we, the thing I will touch base on as a number of groups are using them in the field right now is electrospinning, phase separation, which lyophilization or freeze drying is a form of that, 3D printing and hydrogels. Um, so if you take a look at the literature for the past five years um, and start to look at what type of polymers are people using and what in, in the research literature and what type of fabrication techniques are people using, um, a big snapshot before looking at anything is to say that there's no one size fits all, as you can see here. So the cool thing about biomaterials is you have so many tools at your disposable at your disposal. Um, but then it's tough to say, you know, there's what's ideal, right? So on the polymer side, a lot of groups are using combinations. And what I mean by that is combining synthetic and, and uh, biopolymers. And really that's the holy grail because you're basically getting the both, best of both worlds, ideally. Um, then a lot of groups, including groups that are on this call right now are using decellularized meniscus extracellular matrix. Uh, so they're taking the tissue from um, oftentimes bovine or cow or pig and removing the cells to remove, to reduce the inflammatory response in vivo. And then essentially you now have a, a template that the body already recognizes, right? And it's already organized in its native structure. Uh, and then you can see a lot of groups using other um, synthetic or uh, biopolymers. If you look at the scaffold fabrication techniques, majority of groups are looking at electrospinning. And this is a technique where you basically generate nano to uh, micron diameter fibers which nicely recapitulate the structure of your extracellular matrix. Uh, then a lot of groups are using hydrogels, lyophilized uh, foams, um, adhesives and bio, bio glues, and then 3D printing. So like I said, big picture, there's a lot of tools at your disposal. Uh, and really the meniscus field is, is, is a little bit behind other fields coming into building scaffolding for repair. So I'm going to take the rest of the time just to give snapshots to other groups that have shown some nice response, uh, really important information in vitro and in vivo with materials. So this is uh, first a study from uh, Gordana Bunjak Novakovich's group at Columbia, where they were looking at decellularized meniscus ECM. And so they basically took um, compared it to collagen type one um, gels and showed, if you see, look in this last panel, they're showing ashen blue and picocytous uh, red for the cartilage-like gag matrix and then the collagen, total collagen. And so they show a more robust response in new extracellular matrix formation. This is the in vitro study um, compared to collagen. Uh, and they show again in vivo and a rabbit model, similar results. So the thing I wanna note here is that in their studies and a lot of other studies, TGF beta three is needed. So you, so oftentimes we, it's not a one shot is all right. We have to really think about what the cells are needing for repair. Um, this is a recent study out of Rob Mock's group with Jason Burdick. So Rob Mock's group is getting a lot of shout out today. Um, but they were looking at the stiffness, right? So, the, so essentially the mechanical properties of these fibrous networks and how that might play a role in meniscal fiber chondrocyte migration into this into the material and new collagen formation and so they showed the stiffer matrices matrices in their study was important for migration of the cells into the matrix and then deposition and this is important to think about with the softening study that chang mentioned right because there's a lot of tools to think about here right with on the cell side and the matrix side into what really needs to be done what's this optimal mechanical environment to promote migration and repair and obviously migration and differentiation look different so it's going to be different uh, environments. Uh, and then this is a, this is a recent, um, actually this was from or no, sorry, this isn't from ORS. This is a recent paper from Chang's group where they were looking at um, using materials to control release as Chang kind of mentioned. So the nice thing about polymers um, is they're uh, in, in a lot of fields and in, in the pharma, pharma, pharmacology field too, they use polymers for slow release uh, properties because you can dictate diffusion of the small molecule peptide protein out of the material very readily using polymers in the structure of the scaffold. And so they were looking at kind of an optimal amount of CTF, uh, con connective tissue growth factor in TGF-beta-3 for allowing migration of, of the progenitor cells into the 
defect site and then differentiation and new tissue formation with TGRK3. So, so, and they showed, you know, an optimal amount with the slow release. So this is a way that materials can be used to actually control release of growth factors or biological factors, whatever that may be as well. And then lastly, I want to touch base on uh, tissue adhesives or bioglues. As Chang kind of mentioned it too, but this is something that I think the field's going to move in, into. My lab's very interested in this as well. Uh, because this is something that we might be able to do it arthroscopically, right? Where we can inject in a material that can directly interact with primary, basically primary amines, free, free groups, chemical groups on the injured tissue, um, and then either provide some densification and contraction for just pulling the tissue together, or we also provide a scaffold component for repair. So this is work out of Buma's group there in the Netherlands where they were looking at, oh, sorry, they were looking at um, isocyanates, which is just a chemical group that interacts with the tissue. And so they were showing the, in these two panels, their glue versus fibrin glue, which is often used as the gold standard as it's used in a lot of indications. And they were, they showed um, enhanced push out, uh, enhanced um, interact and mechanics of interaction of that tissue with um, their glue. And then this is another example from Chang's group where they were looking at um, what he kind of mentioned where we have the lubricin and the proteoglycan four come to the injured tissue, kind of absorb on the injured tissue. And so they were looking at, basically having some um, a heparin um, component that binds to heparin bind domain on the lubricin that then has a cross-linked fiber and glue to it. And so they were showing again, better enhanced, um, here they looked at tension, but tension compressive or tension, sorry, modulus when they applied this material. And so they, this is just an example from both of these groups where they were using this glue to glue together um, ex vivo tissue, and then they would pull on it to look at the strength of that interaction. And so they showed this material was much better than fibrin glue alone in that uh, interactive strength. And then lastly, I'll end with, there's so many exciting things happen on the research side, but this is where we currently are, right? So surgeons really at their hands right now have the ability to use sutures or something off label. Um, so fibrin glues, like we've been mentioning, or a collagen wrap that are used in other indications for repair, right? So um, with, with some promise, but there's a lot we can still do, right? And so I wanted to also touch base. There's an, a couple of things that are, if you look, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there's a couple of things that are maybe in the pipeline, but some of the stuff has been a while ago. So there's, you know, hyaluronic acid and collagen sponges that are being looked at at phase one, phase two trials. Um, there's also this recent study that came out of the EU uh, trials with col a collagen sponge with encapsulated mesenchymal stem cells, where they did first in human studies for five patients and, and basically showed of those five patients, three or 60% of them were asymptomatic for two, after two years of using the sponge for repair, um, but two weren't, right? So 60% of the patient, the, the two patients that weren't well actually had to go and have a meniscectomy. So, there's a lot we can still do, but there's a lot of exciting things happening on the research end, um, which, which provides us excitement, right, for what we can do in the future for repair. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for your time and I'll give a shout out to my research group and the collaborators in and out of the university that we work with and funding sources. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions along with all the other speakers. Right. Thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you for sharing that crash course in materials and recent events in materials. I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, I was interested, um, I guess this is kind of for Rob and Jenny. Um, a lot of times when I see those suture repairs on the meniscus, it just seems to me like um, that just has to put a lot of wear and tear on the surrounding cartilage. Um, and so I was wondering if you do see more damage from the suture repairs um, and if there's any new directions we should be looking at to go with sutures or glues the future, um, and what kind of things could we do to improve that area? I think that's a, a very good question. Historically in the past, and we used to have the all inside devices that were more like darts or arrows that used to be prominent. And we commonly see a groove in the articular cartilage from front to back as a joint surface moved over it. With the inside out devices, the sutures are so small, they don't have a problem. And ideally, if the all inside devices we have now are properly placed, we don't see a problem. But some of those still dislodge and some of those pieces can get inside the joint. So maybe once every two months, I'll see one where there's a groove in the articular cartilage from front to back because the devices became prominent. So it's still something we wanna look at and try to eliminate going forward in the future. 
Yeah, I think obviously not having the clinical perspective, but in talking to people like Rob, um, I think ideally if we could have something that we inject through the cannula, right, that completely cross links in the body um, through a bio, you know, so it's not really exothermic, not releasing a lot of heat, whatever, but that can pull the tissue together like without any suture, that's what we're, that's what we're thinking about, right? Being able to do, obviously it's very dependent on the type of tear. Um, but I think that would be really, really awesome. And it's not that the technology couldn't get there quickly, I think, so. Great, thanks for the responses, guys. Um, I have a, a question from the audience, or actually a couple of questions. Um, and these will actually be directed, I think, towards Rob. Um, so from Suzanne Marr, um, what a great talk. Uh, if you do see a ramp tear and the meniscus is already degenerated, do you still try to reattach it? Um, we often hear of an old meniscus in young patients. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that categorization? And Andy Seitz had a kind of a follow-up and, and just saying, what are the most in, important factors in suturing degenerative tears? So I think that's a very good question. We have to remember that there's two functions of the meniscus in that situation. One is to prevent your tibia from sliding forward and, and causing extra stress on your ACL graft. So if there's time where we maybe have 50% of the meniscus remaining, we have to trim some out. I still think it's important when we're doing an ACL reconstruction and especially a revision ACL reconstruction that may have failed because a ramp tear wasn't treated that we should still sew that rim in place to provide the biomechanical focus. It won't be as important as a shock absorber, but obviously if somebody's gonna go through an ACL reconstruction, you wanna give them the best chance it's going to heal. So I think repairing those, even when they are degenerative is important. Um, we're looking at relatively degenerative tears, and this may be in our teenagers and 20 year olds where we're averse to taking them out. I think it's just a matter of trying to ensure that we have the best chance of healing. So we take out the more inner portion of the meniscus that's relatively avascular and try to save as much of the rim as possible. And that often involves using extra sutures. And what we commonly do as clinicians when we see like a horizontal cleavage tear, we'll prepare a fibrin clot and sew that in like peanut butter and jelly sandwich to try to augment healing. So that's something that was done a lot by Henning and his group many years ago but it hasn't been done a lot recently. So we're starting to get back into using fibrin clots again when those degenerative tears show up. Great, thanks Rob. Um, I have one other question from uh, Sonia Bonsal and this is directed towards Chang Li. Um, so if you could only use two of the groups of molecules, you had an excellent schematic on, on all of these different potential factors, but let's say you could only use two which two would you use and which two would be most useful? And I think the last bit of her question was great. Which two would be most synergistic, right? We, we want synergy between these different factors. And, and I think if you can comment on that. It's like, so she asked me the very tough question to answer. So, you know, I think that she already know that it's, uh, you know, really hard to find, you know, select the two, right? Because I mentioned there's lots of things involved there. So now, so far, our group has been focused on recruitment cells and followed by the healing and integration and remodeling. So that can be done by a couple of the cross factors, including CTG, FTG, 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 FTG. But and as I just added at the last part of my slides, we need to think about immune reaction, remodeling, and inflammation, and making up so many, so many things involved there. So it's just, I would say, no, I cannot answer the question. So it's, we don't know yet. So and I know, including myself, many people are working to find uh, you know, best combination, but I would like, feel, I feel like we would end up with more than two at least. So two is a two liter to answer. So I hope she's satisfied with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand it was a really tough question. So thank you, Chang. One final question. Um, and this, you know, we, we obviously heard the, the clinical side of things with Rob's talk. Um, we heard Jenny and Chang cover a lot of these biomaterial and biological um, advances in recent years. So Rob, I'll ask you, of those advances that Jenny and Chang covered, what do you think is most promising? Like, what do you see really taking off in the next few years and, and really um, impacting patients and treatment? I, I think the most important thing going on in the future is trying to accelerate healing. So better than we're seeing with these relatively avascular structures and trying to ensure healing. So 
accelerating healing is important because rehabilitation takes so much out of a patient. If we have to keep them non-weight bearing for six weeks, they have atrophy, even using blood flow restriction. And it's important to try to get them back to the workforce or back to their sport or just back to normal lives. So if we can work on healing faster and accelerating the healing process so we have a better chance of success, that would be the important thing, whether it's it's trying to get the, the synovial um, MSCs to grow in or chemo traction uh, of those or, or just the simple multiple things that we've gone through today in terms of trying to get the healing to occur. But I think a lot of the reasons some people choose not to have their meniscus repaired is because they don't want to be held up for so long or be on crutches for six weeks. So if we can accelerate those processes, I, I think that would help patients to improve their overall function and get back to activity sooner. Great. Thanks, Rob. I, I just wanted to thank um, Rob, Jenny, and Chang for three really wonderful presentations that work really well together. Um, it, it's great that the meniscus field is coming together. Um, I just thank the moderators, uh, so Jenny Kutzer and Chat Jayasuria. Um, and again, thank the speakers and all of the attendees. Uh, so with that, that concludes our ORS webinar on the future of meniscal repair. Thanks, everyone.